Kids in the booming metropolis of Des Moines, Iowa, <laughs> where there are as many stalks of corn as there are people. That's not actually true. There's more corn than people. Uh, but I fly out tomorrow morning, so uh, I've managed to make it through last week uh, without uh, dying or burning the house down or killing the dog. I did. Uh, I did think that there was a potential that I might have lost the dog at one point, and I thought, that's it, I'm the worst dad ever, I've lost my kid's dog, uh, but she was just hiding under the shed and didn't want to respond to me when I came outside. Um, but as soon as I brought food out, she perked up, so and we're all good there. Uh, so I have managed to survive, I'm sure I've probably gained some weight since you saw me last, because my wife likes to make like a meal that has... Uh, one side and then another side of veggies and then some kind of meat like that's kind of the go-to there she does pasta there's always like broccoli and me I had like Totino's pizza rolls bagel bites and burritos and then the next day I had queso and the next day I had some like buffalo wings and then some more queso and then uh, yeah I ate a, just a, I ate a bunch of junk I ate a ton of junk the healthiest this will tell you how bad it was the healthiest meal I had was last night when one of my buddies that works at Snowbird said, hey, you wanna to go to Rip Country and go bowling? And so the healthiest meal I had all week was uh, a smoked turkey intimidator sandwich at Rib Country, which is like eight pieces of smoked turkey between garlic bread for, for buns. Um, so that's where I'm at. If I have a heart attack, you will know why. Um, but so, so I survived a couple things before we dive into the text this morning that I wanna uh, just kinda to work through. The first one is the baptism class is today. I know we announced that in the announcements, but I want to make sure you understand like there is still time for you to sign up for the baptism class. Uh, even if you're not sure you want to be baptized, you're kind of wrestling through that, trying to figure out what it means, come to the class. The worst thing that can happen is you come to the class and then you decide you don't want to be baptized. Like That's fine. We can do that. Um, and so that'll be right after service. We do have food for that um, for those folks who are wanting to be part of the baptism class. Um, we should... We should have enough food, I hope. Uh, I've ordered enough for like 10 people, and so far I think we've got like six on the baptism list. So feel free, if you really want to be baptized, go for it. And I would love for you to take part in the class, and we'll, uh, we'll walk through what your story is in salvation, why baptism is important, and come to that uh, conclusion whether or not you, you need to be or want to be baptized. So be there for that. The second announcement uh, or thing to kind of go over housekeeping-wise is some of you have asked, a lot of you have asked, where are we at in our pastor search? Where, what does that look like? You know, we had Mike Crow here a couple weeks ago. Is he the guy? Is he not the guy? What does that look like for us? Uh, and the answer I have for you is yes and no. <laughs> uh, we are still in the pastor search process, uh, and we, we have not made a decision yes or no uh, on who the next guy will be, but we did want to get a second look at Mike. Uh, and so he will be back here next Sunday with his family to preach for us again. And he's going to be hanging out at the baptisms for a chance for you to kind of meet him and talk to him uh, and, and kind of just hang out with him and get to know him a little bit and figure out, uh, I guess, make your judgment call on him. <coughs> uh, and uh, we're bringing him in because we want to be able to see him preach one more time. We want to talk to him one more time, get to know him a little bit better and see if he's going to be the right guy or not. Uh, so that's not a yes or no. That's just that, hey, we want to get a second look at him. Uh, and he knows that. We've, we've, we've made that clear to him. Uh, and so we want everybody to get a chance to meet him and, and kind of figure out if he's going to be the guy for the job or not. So that answers your question as far as the pastor search thing goes. Until we get somebody, I ain't going nowhere, so you'll be all right. I hope that or you'll be severely demented in your head uh, and have weird thoughts because of me. One way or the other, win-win. So if you got your Bibles, uh, this morning we're going to be in Colossians chapter 2. And so we're walking through the book of Colossians right now. Uh, and so for the past three weeks, we've been looking at chapter one. And so we looked at, uh, first and foremost, what, what Paul says in his greeting in chapter one, where he talks about uh, his thankfulness, and he kind of lays out characteristics that a believer should live by. And then we look uh, in the middle of chapter one, where Paul, he gives us really solid theology, where he says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is God incarnate. He's going to make a point in the book of Colossians to repeatedly come back to that, that Jesus is God, period. He's going to come back to that over and over and over and over again. But he's going to tell us there in chapter 2, he told us, man, Jesus is preeminent. He's been before all things. He will be past all things. All things were created through him. Right? He's echoing what John tells us in John chapter 1, that Jesus has always been and always will be, and Jesus is in charge. 
right? He's part of the Trinitarian Godhead. He is all authority, right? All authority comes from God. All authority comes through Jesus. Jesus is our example of all authority. We, we believe this. And then last week we looked at what it means to suffer. What, right? Paul talks about why he suffered, how he suffered, for what reason? So that the gospel would be known by all people. The gospel would be known by all people. And so that's where we ended up last week. And so this week we're going to look at the first ten verses of chapter 2. So if you got your Bibles, uh, flip on over to Colossians chapter 2 and we'll pick up there. He says this in verse 1. He says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those of Laodicea. And for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all riches of full assurance, of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, and whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that, you, that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. But though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells, and you have been filled with him who is the head of all rule and authority. I'm praying with that. God, we ask this morning you teach us from your word. God, that you would be with us. That you'd show us what we need to see. You remove any thoughts from my head that don't need to be there. You remove any words from my mouth that don't need to be there. But God, your word would be clearly spoken and taught uh, by your spirit moving through me. God, I pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, so Paul begins here and he says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea. And for all who have not seen me face to face. We know that Paul has not been to Colossae. He's not been to Laodicea. He is trained Epaphras, right? We talked about this week, one of the series, that Epaphras was the pastor and the elder of this church. And he was trained and discipled by Paul. He was sent there. And Epaphras is who brings this letter to the church at Colossae. Uh, and most, most scholars believe that he's been instructed to take this letter to Colossae to have them read it, and then to take it next door to Laodicea. So Laodicea is right next door to Colossae. Very similar cultures. Matter of fact, Colossae was a booming town until earthquakes kind of took its toll. And so the people of Colossae, most of them, scooted over about two miles to Laodicea. Now Laodicea we see in Scripture one other time. We see that in the book of Revelation chapter 3. So uh, in Revelation chapter 3, John is given this word for seven churches. Right? He's given a word for seven churches. One of those is Laodicea. And honestly... Laodicea probably has the most scathing of all of the letters written to them. I mean, it's pretty rough and harsh the way that, that Jesus speaks to the church. He says this in uh, Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 through 21. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot, or you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spew you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and a salve to put in your eyes, so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To know the uh, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Right? It's kind of a scathing thing that he says to the church of Laodicea. Right? Like we've heard a big chunks of that passage probably quoted over and over again. I mean, people have misquoted the "I stand at the door of your heart and knock" thing for decades. Right? Where they give that I see Jesus just saying the door of your heart and knocking. No, no, he's talking about, he's sitting there saying, repent. If you repent, I will come in and I will change you. I will, I will have communion with you. I will eat with you. I will, I will bond with you. We will have a friendship. We will have a kinship together. But he says at the beginning of this, probably one of the most famous verses in all of the book of Revelation. Revelation 3.16. Be hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I want to spew you out of my mouth. Man, that's harsh. Those are hard words to hear. Right? Like that word in the Greek for spew you out of my mouth is exactly what you would think it would be. It means to vomit. Like that some translations put spit there that I want to spit you out of my mouth. No, he's saying like you make me sick to my stomach and nauseous. I want to spew you. Man, this is 
This is a difficult one for us because honestly, if that's what Laodicea described as, and that's what Colossae is described as, can we not also relate to that? I mean, that's the church in a nutshell, especially here in America. We got this lukewarm Christianity thing going on where we, you know, we want to be about Jesus. We want to claim that God loves America, right? Be patriotic, but we, we don't really want to be obedient to the Lord. Right? We, we like to skip the passage in Scripture that demand us to put off our old self and to put off our old flesh and to make war on sin and to kill the things that are ravaging us. And we want to take what's ours as ours and just say Jesus is an addition to my life. And that is never what Scripture commands of us. And that's never what Scripture should have us teach to anybody. And God's going to judge me if I ever were to say to someone, you just do your thing. God's going to be with you. It's cool. Now, he, he demands obedience from us. He demands that we be passionately pursuing him, chasing down Jesus, running after Jesus. I mean, Paul gives us so many analogies in Scripture for running the race and striving for the faith, trying to, to chase down holiness and righteousness. But that doesn't work for us. Right? We, we can't earn righteousness. Nothing I or you have ever done in our entire life has ever been righteous by its own work. I can't strive for righteousness. You can't strive for righteousness. We are not righteous people by work, right? Like we're born sinful. We believe that. Scripture teaches that. David writes about that in the Psalms. That in my mother's womb I was conceived in sin. And in iniquity I was brought forth. Right? We know that we deal with sin from the moment we're brought into this earth. We're sinful people. So I can't do anything of righteousness on my own. But here's the beautiful thing. God provides the righteousness for us. Right? Like, how many of you guys uh, have, are parents, you have, you have kids, and at some point your kid has wanted to buy you a Father's Day gift, birthday gift, something, some kind of gift, right? And so your spouse takes them to the store, and they pick something out, and they bring it to you for a gift, right? It's awesome. It's adorable. Everybody loves it. Like, every parent loves to have their kid give them a gift because it shows them that they really like they love you, they want to do something nice for you. But whose money provides for the gift? <laughs> it's like you're buying yourself a gift, right? Like, well, my kids are like, I want to get my dad this. They go buy something. Well, where did the money come from? My bank account. Right? Like, I, that's my money. But is it not a beautiful thing when a kid does that? That's exactly what God does with us, with righteousness. Right? Like, we have no righteousness of our own, and so we must seek the Lord to give us his righteousness. So he takes his righteousness, and he places it on us. He gives it to us, and that's all he asks for in return is for us to give his righteousness back to him. That's how he sees us. When he sees us in the eyes of eternity, God does not see your sin anymore if you're in Christ. He sees his righteousness that's been applied to you by the blood of Jesus. He sees that in you. But he's the one who has to provide that righteousness for you. And so that's what he does right here, right? He says, uh, he's talking about how he struggles for those that, Paul's talking about how he struggles for those at Colossae and Laodicea, that he wants them to be knit together in love. Right? He wants them to be knit together in love. And the only way to do that is for them to have the righteousness of Christ applied to them. That's what makes us no longer lukewarm. Because if you really have the righteousness of Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you and it drives you and pushes you. You should have a desire for the word of God. You have a desire for the Lord. And not just for what he can give you, but the fact that man, he stepped out in your condition and gave you righteousness. That's what we've often heard of, referred to as the great exchange. That's how we teach it to our kids. That man, you had badness. And God took your badness and gave you his goodness. That's what happens at the cross. He takes your badness and he gives you his goodness. He gives you his righteousness. He provides that for you. He applies that to you. And so Paul then says... For all who have not seen me face to face, he wants to encourage them. He says that their hearts may be encouraged, be knit together in love. Knit together in love. Now, I don't know if you've ever looked at my hands and said, you know, he really looks like he knits. <laughs> um, I have dainty little, no, I got little sausage fingers, okay? I don't knit, I've never knitted anything in my life. I, don't, I tried to sew a pair of pants one time. You know what that went with? I sewed it. It was a really ugly stitch, but I thought, that'll hold. Went outside and went, and it tore, right? I mean, just busted right open. I had apparently not, like, looped it through the knot. And so when I did like this, the string went, and just unraveled through every hole. I just, so now, not only did I have a tear, but I had a tear and holes in it. You know, like, that's the extent of my sewing uh, and fabric stuff. But So I've never been a knitter. But 
I did work the strangest job I've ever worked in uh, my entire life, and probably will be the strangest job I will ever work in my entire life, where uh, I worked at a fiber processing mill. So I don't know if anybody knows what a fiber processing mill is, but it is a dirty, nasty, gross job. And what you do is people from all over the country would ship us boxes of shorn sheep and alpaca and llama fleece. Yeah, see where I'm going with this? They would ship it. So like, imagine taking a nasty dirty animal, shearing it, packing all of its dirty hair in a box in a trash bag, and then shipping it halfway across the country. Then my job was to open said box of nasty wool and stick my hands in it and pull that junk out and weigh it. And sheep wool's greasy, it's got lanolin in it, it's like grimy, and then I would have to lay it out on this table that had holes in it and pull off all of the bugs and dirt clods oh. and doo-doo and I mean everything, all the nasties, <laughs> through the holes in the floor, and then you take the sheep wool, separate it in the bins, wash it. And so we'd wash the wool, and then we'd, you'd have to tuft it. So if you want to know it's more gross than nasty, dirty sheep wool, wet sheep wool. It will make you feel really nauseous inside. So we pull this wet wool out of these, this washing machine and then have to tuft it individually onto a rack to dry. So we lay all this fiber out to dry and it would dry. Then you have to run it through a machine that separates all of the guard hairs, so these wiry like beard hairs out of it, and leaves all the fluffy stuff out the back side. And so you take the fluffy stuff and then you run it through a machine called a carding machine. So the carding machine has these big thick teeth that go this way and then a drum barrel that spins this way. And so they, they spin like this together and the wool comes into it and it stretches that and shreds it for a second and then intertwines those fibers together to make this stuff called roving. And so rovering is a, a strap of sheep wool all linked together like this that just comes in a big long strand. But with roving, it's not attached to anything. It's not twisted, it's not, not it's just kind of interlaced. So you can take that roving and go and just shred it into pieces. So in order to make yarn out of that, they take the rope and they put a machine that then twists it and spins it into a really thin piece. And then they take that really thin piece and they take multiple bobbins of it and braid them together to make one strand of yarn. You get three ply, four ply, that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I, I've never knitted before, but I, I brought some visual aids today. I don't normally do this, but here you go. Um, so, uh, when I worked at the fiber mill, I had the opportunity to make some yarn. And so this here is a good piece of yarn. So this is, this is called Lopi. It's made from isolated sheep wool. And so you've got these little strands, and it's twisted and, and spun together really tight, and it's durable. I mean, you can pull it pretty hard. It's not going to break. Uh, so this is good yarn. Now, this stuff is just twisted and not at all together, and that's what keeps it from fraying and falling apart. But what I really wanted to show you was, uh, was this stuff which you knit with these needles. Um, oh my gosh. Which I think I can pull this off. You don't need dainty fingers to knit with these things. Uh, I mean, if you're walking with these things, you, it's like a knife. You're gonna put this thing, point down, you stake yourself in the heart, you know? You imagine if one of these went like, you know, disaster, okay, disaster. So you have these big knitting needles here, and you knit uh, this stuff right here, which is called cord. It's huge, it's massive. It's this huge, thick, super thick yarn. And so how this stuff works is when it comes out of the back of the machine that's roving, <coughs> excuse me, it falls onto a nylon cord. So it has a foundation to it, right? It has a, a nylon piece of string that this stuff falls on top of and then twists really fast in, the, uh, in a false twist tube, and that's what gets it. So this stuff, like on the end of it here, it's just, you can just tuft it apart here. So it'll just come to pieces. You can see how thin that stuff is. But in the middle here, I mean, this stuff is solid. It's got a nylon cord in it, so it won't break, it won't fall apart. And so what people do with this is they use those giant knitting needles and they knit some of the biggest scarves I've ever seen. Or rugs, like an eight foot by eight foot rug that weighs like 150 pounds. It's so heavy. Um, it's the warmest you'll ever be. You also might die underneath it when you can't get out. So don't get under one of those uh, blankets unless you know how to bench press, um, because otherwise you might suffocate. But I say all that to say this. So they knit this stuff together and they make these tightly knit scarves and they're so soft and so warm. I know that sounds very uh, feminine, but just deal with it, okay? Um, <laughs> it's super soft and super warm. It's, it's, they're neat, like, I don't know how people do this stuff. But they knit this stuff together. But here's what's crazy. You take one strand of that and you start at one end of it and you can just peel it off. 
and pull the nylon cord out of it at the end of it. And if the nylon cord's out of it, that stuff is worthless, right? Like it just shreds up into little cotton balls, like just puffs into big tufts of wool. Nothing you can do with it. But when it has the nylon cord, it has a foundation. What is our foundation? Christ. Christ is in all, above all. That's what Paul's been saying for the last three weeks in the book of Colossians, that Jesus is preeminent. He is in all. He is above all. He is the foundation of all things. Jesus is it. Jesus is what life's about. Jesus is everything to us. He needs to be everything to you. He needs to be everything to you. He needs to be everything to me. He needs to be what our families, our marriages, our businesses, our work ethic, our fun activities, all of that needs to be founded on Jesus Christ. That's our foundation. That's the core inside of our yarn here. But then what happens with that? If you just leave that yarn, is it cool? Yeah, it's got a core and it's nice and cool. You can't break it really. But what good is it if it's just a ball of yarn? Like what do you, what do you use a ball of yarn for? Entertaining cats, and cats are from the devil. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm super allergic to cats, so I hate cats. But right, like, there's nothing you can do with a ball of yarn. It's just a ball of yarn. You need to make something out of it. So you knit it into something. And so what he's saying here is he's saying, man, the, the body was never meant to just be one person. Right? We're founded in Christ, but believers are never meant to be lone wolf Christians just hanging out doing their thing. No, Christians are meant to be in community. Even when that means you're being sent out, you go to a place and there's no believers, you're called to make disciples so that there is believers. To train up people in the word and build a community and a church body together. Christianity was always meant to be done as a community. From the very beginning, the church has always been a core foundation. That's why it says that the church is the bride of Christ. It's inseparable from Christ. But the, the bride of Christ is meant to be multiple members. Right? Like we see this. And Paul says this and reiterates this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where he says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all of the members are of the body, though many, they are one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks... Slaves are free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would make it not any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If we are all, if all were a single member, where would, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need for you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are to be to treat with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. That there are many, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Right? We're all knit together in love, but we all have our own different roles and parts inside the body of Christ. Like we all, it takes multiple strands of yarn to knit together and to make something. For us to, to functionally be knit together, it means having multiple parts that are all intertwined one or the other. If you were to take a look at that yarn, you'll see that there's pieces going in all different directions and they're knotted and twisted and looped over each other so that it all holds together. Each of us has our own compartment, our own part inside of this body and the global body of the church. We're right? like, I mean, I hate to break this to you, but like, I am not perfect, right? Like, anybody else can agree with that? You're not perfect? Yeah, me neither. I'm not a perfect person. And there are things that I am definitively not good at inside of the church body, right? Like, I do not envy Brenda's job. I could not do children's ministry. I love my kids. I just don't like other people's kids. <laughs> But like, I love kids. I think kids are great. But put me in a room with 30 kids screaming loudly, 
and I might go insane. Right? Like that's just not how my body works. Like I, my kids, I love them. I love hanging out with kids. I love when all of our kids are together. When a bunch of us go and do something together, and our kids play. But it's one of those things where, like, man, I, I don't think I could do it for a prolonged amount of time to have a bazillion kids that you can't discipline or guide. Right? Like, there's a fine age limit there where you're able to to say stop doing this, and a kid is like. Okay, I get it. Right? There's like this age of like four years old where you can tell other people's kids stop doing that and they'll look at you like, <laughs> maybe. <me." laughs> it's just a fun, like, and there are people who are wired that know how to handle that and I'd be like, you little punk. You got to tussle. Right? Like, I'm not built that way. I'm not built for kids ministry. And so that is not my working and I have no desire to ever do that, ever. And so I've got a bunch of friends that are youth pastors here, and they are both youth and children's pastor, and I'm like, mm, I do not envy your job. Uh, and they're like, I don't, I don't envy your job, because a lot of them are like, I can't sing anything. I can't play an instrument. I would be horrible at that job. And it's the same thing. Like, you know, over the course of the last nine and a half months, as I've been filling in here, multiple people have said, Man, why don't, why don't you be the senior pastor? Why don't you just stick with it up there? And I'm like, y'all don't see me Monday through Friday. <laughs> you don't see the areas that I lack in administration. The areas that I lack in counsel. The areas that I lack uh, in, in kind of just watching over and shepherding the flock. Areas that I'm, I don't think I'm gifted in yet. Maybe the Lord will grow me into those, but it's areas that I see shortcomings. That I, I think, I'm not ready to be that. That's the reason I love being in student ministry, because it's like the perfect medium where the administration stuff is less daunting than being a senior pastor. Plus, you can look at uh, middle school and high school students and say, stop being an idiot. And they go, okay. <laughs> right? Like, they respond. You look at adults and say, stop being an idiot, and at least one person in this room would be like, I'm never going back to that church. Yeah. He told us all to be, that we were idiots. We're, do you have the bulletin? It's got the elder's number on the back. Let's call it. Who's the elder I'm calling? I'm calling. I'm complaining. I have some grievances. <laughs> They're like, you can't do that. You can't be that way with adults. Adults are significantly softer and less moldable. Like, you get set in your ways, and you're just like, no, this is how I'm doing it. Teenagers, you have this, this kind of cool moment and opportunity in their life where you can be a little harsher with them when it comes to, like, no, you need to stop and do this. Because they're a little more moldable. And I think my most formidable years that, that the most stuff was impressed upon me was my teenage years. And I still remember the things I learned from my wrestling coach in high school, life lessons that at the time I did not fully grasp and understand. That now I think, and I'm super thankful that he took the time to speak those things into my life. And we're not even talking about a spiritual level, just on a physical like life level. He taught me a lot about asking for help when you need it. About understanding that you're not invincible and you can't just pull yourself up from your bootstraps all the time. Sometimes you have to ask someone to help you. Sometimes you need accountability to get through something. And so that's what the body of Christ is meant to be. Right? Like, there's, there's so many intricate parts. And so there's some of you in this room that you're terrified of the idea of leading a small group. You're terrified of the idea of speaking in small group or, or sharing or teaching in any capacity. But that's what the Lord is calling you to do. He's gifted you and he's preparing you to do those things. Right? I, I can think of multiple people in here that over the last year, they've had to conquer a lot of fears in their life and step up to the plate in different avenues of our church. And God has used that to grow them in crazy ways out of obedience. On the same token, there's some of you that you really desire to teach and, and do this, but that's not really your gifting. Maybe your gifting is hospitality. You're the kind of people that we need out there like uh, shaking hands and kissing babies and acting like a politician on the front porch. You know, like, you're the person out there, you need to be pouring people's coffee because when they see your face, they're like, this, this church is really nice. I should keep going here. Right? That's before they even get through the doors. Did you know that 85% that of people choose whether or not they're going to come back to a church before they ever sit down in the seat for the service? 85% of people. Just based on what the building looks like on the outside, what the parking lot looks like, and what the first people they meet, how friendly the people are coming around the doors. Now, I can vouch for this, that we've talked to people who have literally said of this church, 
They're so friendly, they're almost too friendly. <laughs> so congratulations! You're really nice people, all of you. Um, but we need those folks. Some of you, you were terrified of the idea of volunteering for the nursery or kids ministry. You think you're like me, but you're not like me. Some of you, I've heard you, I've heard you say this. Some people I've heard say, well, I, you know, I've graduated out of that. I, all my kids are grown, and so I'm done with parenting. I'm done with kid raising. I, you know, I'm, I'm out of that season of life. That makes you perfect. That makes you perfect because you're like the sweet grandmother. Right? Like, grandmothers just, like, love on the kids, give them a sucker, and send them away. And that's, you know, like, the kids don't ever have to hate you. It's perfect. That's what you should be here. You would fit perfectly in kids' ministry. All you have to do is be there and hang out with people. Some of you are perfectly fit for that. Some of you, because you don't have kids, because you're older in age and you've raised your kids, you're the kind of people who have wisdom and insight to pour into these kids' lives. And so get over the fear. In order to be knit together in love and be a body that functions together with multiple parts, you got to assume your role and figure out where you fit. <laughs> I feel like a lot of times in churches, we, we don't do this. You know, like the majority of churches, it's less than 25% of the church attendees actually serve in ministries of the church. And it should be more like 75%. We should have only 25% of people not doing stuff. And they should be the people who have only been here two or three Sundays. And then we'll get them involved, right? It needs to be everybody working together for the goal. Right? And then... So that's what he says, right? He says, we need to be knit together in love right? so that it encourages our hearts. And then he says this, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's <coughs> mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. When you serve your part in the body of Christ, you'll grow in wisdom and knowledge. When you put hands and feet and action into what you believe, you'll grow in knowledge and wisdom. That's just by nature, like... Not everybody is an auditory learner. Not everyone is a visual learner. But everybody, if you do something enough times, you'll figure out how to do it. Right? Like I would say that majority, barring a few of the small children in here, you know how to write. Well, how did you learn how to write? You put a pencil or a pen in your hand, and you did it over and over and over and over again. Right? Like You can think back to those sheets that they gave you where it had the A and you had to follow the dotted line and copy the A and you drew everything and you wrote everything out. You learn by doing those things. The same thing happens inside the body of Christ. You learn to grow in faith and the Lord grows you and stretches you and molds you by doing and being active in the body, by taking action. Right? That, that's part of this. And, and here's the thing though, it, it's not easy. It's not easy to grow in wisdom and knowledge. Right? That's the reason I think that Paul says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Well, what is treasure? It's something you've got to dig and mine and, and scruff out, right? Like you've got to, you have to work to get to the hidden treasures, to discover things. So Paul's saying, man, as you work out, as you do these things, as you grow in Christ, as you put hands and feet to what the Lord is teaching you, you'll begin to dig and mine and find the hidden treasures of wisdom that he has for you. You grow in wisdom. Why? Why is it important you grow in wisdom? He says it right here in verse 4. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. No one will delude you with plausible arguments. Man, our world is full of plausible arguments. You don't think so? Just turn on the television. Right? Like our world is full of plausible arguments. To the point that the church has been invaded with plausible arguments. Right? Right? Moral laws we've understood from Scripture for over 2,000 years are being challenged and eroded and pulled away from the church because of plausible arguments. We wrestle back and forth, and this isn't a political dialogue. It's just the truth of the matter that the world is full of plausible arguments. You don't believe me? Right? Like society, society mirrors itself in different ways for all of history. Right at the time that Paul's writing this, history had things where people debated philosophy and politics and religion in places like Rome, and they had they had whole auditoriums devoted just for that. You know what we have? Facebook. That's what we have for that. We have Facebook for people to argue politics. But the difference is they would debate in a peaceful manner and hang out together. We have crossed that threshold now. Now when we debate politics and religion and philosophy, we just get really nasty and abrasive because we don't have to do it face to face. We do it over in a digital world. Right? In places like Rome in this time period, the plausible arguments were there, right? There were people who, who had whole uh, like villas and stuff 
that were specifically designed and built for people to watch and engage in sexual immorality. We have the internet. Right? We have a vast world of the internet at our fingertips. And it, internet pornography and these websites where people can hook up with one another is destroying marriages mm -hmm. and families across the world. <clears throat> across the world. Right? Like, these things are destroying the church. I mean, every week it feels like there's a new Christian leader who falls in some capacity in that regard. And 90% of it is sexual immorality. <clears throat> Why? Why is this happening? Because they've been deluded by plot of arguments that this is behind closed doors. This is a sin that no one sees. So they engage in it, and then it eats out of it, and it eats out of it, and it eats out of it, and eventually it takes root, and once it takes root, it's hard to defeat. It's hard to snuff out. I heard an old Southern pastor one time say, uh, habitual sin is like kudzu. You can't kill it, you can't get rid of it, it's just there all the time. Right? And that's what it's like in our lives. It takes root, and it's hard to, to snuff it out. The world is filled with plausible arguments. Well, how do we defeat plausible arguments? That's what Paul's going to say is here. And this isn't like a thorough, depth, in-depth thing on, on, a, on a apologetics. Like, I would love for us to do an apologetics class sometime and talk about really defending the faith. But, like, these are point blank. This is scripturally the foundation from which you can begin to have an apologetic. The word apologetic simply means to make a defense of, a defense of your faith. And the first thing he says there is this in verse number 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. So walk in Him. Well, how did you receive Christ Jesus? By the Spirit, right? Scripture tells us, John 6, 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. John 6, 63 and 65, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and those who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. John 15, 26. But when the helper comes, the word helper is the same word used for the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. And here in John, it's also the same word used uh, in uh, Genesis when Eve is made. It says, I'll make a helper fit for him. Right? This is, this is accountability for you. So, gentlemen in the room, your wife is like... A Holy Spirit to your life. Take heed. Right? The truth of the matter, my wife pushes and pulls me sometimes into directions that feel really uncomfortable, but it's what I need to do because she understands that I'm about to screw up. Right? It's the truth of it. When I was working at Lowe's and going in at 3 in the morning and hated my job and was like, I don't want to do life anymore. At 3 in the morning, I roll out of bed and she would be like, you can do it. Something else will happen. One day, something else will come. <laughs> Little I know the whole time she was going, he's got to do something. He's miserable. I don't know if you've ever tried to go move appliances at 3.30 in the morning in the back of Lowe's, but it is not fun. Okay? It is not enjoyable. It's hot. You're lonely. And if you're someone like me that talks nonstop, you start talking to yourself and everybody thinks you're crazy. <laughs> truth. Then they thought it was even crazier because I, I brought a speaker in there and would play a uh, sermon podcast. Oh. <laughs> I've got all these guys around me that are not believers and I have Matt Chandler blaring for the whole back of the building at four in the morning as I'm moving appliances. Hey, it worked for me. Hopefully it laid some sort of seed in their life. Um, right, like the spirit is what brings you. So that word helper there when it says, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father and bears witness about me. Titus 3, 5, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. You walked into your relationship with Christ by the Holy Spirit. You were drawn into your relationship with Christ by the Spirit, pushing and pulling. Right? Many of us in this room, you can think back to that moment when you felt it. Like you felt this pull and tug at your heart drawing you to step up, drawing you to come down and kneel at the altar, drawing you to have a conversation with somebody. Man, it was crying out saying, you need Jesus. You felt that. That's the Spirit calling you into a relationship with Christ. So the Spirit draws you in. And so you, right, he says, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. So you received Jesus by the Spirit, then what do you do? You walk in the Spirit. Right? You walk in the Spirit. 
So Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 25, he says, But I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And then he tells us, Now the works of the flesh are evident, and he lays them out for us. Sexual immorality, purity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or injuring one another. You walk by the Spirit. And if you walk by the Spirit, you will put to death the things of the flesh. You'll put to death sexual immorality. you put to death impurity. you put to death idolatry, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, rivalry, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, and all the things like these. You will put to death those things in your life if you walk by the Spirit. Because as you received Christ, so walk in Him, which was by the Spirit of God. Right? He empowers you. We talked about this last week. That what Paul says this at the end of chapter 1 when he says that he may represent everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil and struggle with all His energy and that He powerfully works within me. Right? We work with Christ's energy and His power and His authority. Why? Because His Spirit now lives inside of you if you're in Christ. You have the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead and it lives and it reigns inside of your body. Right? It reigns inside of you. And so, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. And then he says, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving. Right? That's the second thing that we do to, to defend against plausible arguments is that we must be rooted in the Word of God. You have to be rooted in the Word. If you are not a student of the Word, if you are not a person who is rooted and built up and established in the Word of God, you will be easily defeated. You will be. That's the truth of it. Right? It's not just knowing that the Bible is true. It's applying the Bible to your life. Right? Like probably one of the biggest names in textual criticism of, of Scripture is a guy named Bart Ehrman. He's a professor at UNC Chapel Hill. And he teaches uh, a class. He teaches or is the dean of the whole religion department. And he teaches on textual criticisms. Now, he is not a believer in Christ. He does not in any way, shape, or form endorse Christianity. But he believes, right? He, he's talking in, in one of the, the prologues to this book he wrote called Denying Jesus. Right? Like, he's a guy who definitively does not believe in Jesus. He wrote about a biblical theologian named Bruce Metzger. And so Bruce Metzger is this super smart guy. He's dead now. But he was super, super smart when it came to uh, textual criticism and all about the accuracy and inerrancy of Scripture. And he said this, he said, you know, Bruce Metzger is one of the greatest scholars of modern times. He said, I'm dedicating this book to him because he's both my inspiration for doing uh, and going into textual criticism. And even though we may disagree on important religious questions, he's a firmly committed Christian and I'm not. We are in complete agreement on a number of very important historical and textual questions. And then he says this, if he and I were put in a room and asked to hammer out a consensus statement on what we think the original text of the New Testament would probably look like, there would be very few points of disagreement. Here's a guy who does not believe what the Bible teaches, but he will tell you the Bible is a good book. It's a good document. It's textually accurate. What's the difference? He knows the Bible. The difference is, is he doesn't apply the Bible. He's not rooted in the Scripture. I mean, he, plenty of people know the Word of God. Richard Dawkins has got three PhDs. He knows the Word of God inside and out. He does not believe it because he chooses not to. It doesn't apply to his life. In order for you to be rooted and built up and established in your faith, you must not only believe the Word of God, you must apply the Word of God. You must apply the Scripture to your life. You must use the Word of God to make you a new creation. Right? That's what Scripture has promised you. You must use the Word of God as a weapon. Right? Scripture refers to itself repeatedly as a sword. I love this. I love, I have this quoted on a t-shirt. I have it on a journal. I have it on stickers. I have it everywhere. If you go to my office, you can find something with it on there really quickly. 
to quote my Puritan writer named John Owen from a book called The Mortification of Sin, which, by the way, is like the coolest name for a book ever. The Mortification of Sin. Right? It just sounds like it sounds like a death metal band. Mortification of Sin. <laughs> you know, like, it just sounds mean. But he's talking about killing sin. And he says this, and it just stuck with me. From the very first moment I heard it, this has always stuck with me. John Owen says, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Mm. Right? Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. There is no middle ground. Right? You, there is no, I'm a peaceful non-combatant in this fight. I'm just living my life. No, 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 no. You are in the fight, period. Right? You're the country that was invaded by an enemy. And so you have to either decide if you're going to fight for the side of freedom or if you're going to bow down to the enemy and just roll with it because you're afraid. Because that's exactly what saying I'm a non-combatant in my sin life is. It's being a coward. God has never called you to be a coward in your fight with sin. He has called you to put to death the lusts and desires of your heart. Scripture is chock full of verses like this. Romans 8.13 For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Right? He says this uh, in Matthew 5, chapter 29 and 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And then Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 through 6. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. If you struggle against sin, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your own blood. And I have forgotten, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Man, that's got a sting. We have not resisted our own sin to the point of shedding blood. Right? Like, I know that, that that passage in Matthew about cutting your eye out is, is probably supposed to be metaphorical, but like, have we ever really thought that? Have we ever really gone to the point of, I'm willing to do whatever is necessary to defeat my sin? Have you been there? Have you done that? Most of us have it. Right? Like, if you struggle with pornography, throw your computer out. Right? Like, put software on it. Do whatever you have to do. And I said this one time, we were hanging out and with a bunch of students at Snowbird, and we said this whole thing about... You know, being willing to do whatever is necessary to kill sin. And so if you got to, remove your computer so it's not an issue. And this kid sent us a video two weeks later where he took his laptop out in the backyard and shot it with a shotgun. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, um, I don't know, your mama's going to be too happy with that. You just blew up a $500 computer with a shotgun. But he got the point, right? Like he got it. It clicked. Something clicked in his head. That he, he knew he had needed to do whatever was necessary to stop himself from falling in that path of sin. Are you willing to do what's necessary? Are you willing to do what's necessary? Or are you like the people in Hebrews chapter 12? We haven't, you haven't resisted sin to the point of shedding blood yet. You stopped just short. Why? Because we like to be close to our sin. Because deep down and inside, we like to keep our sin pretty, pretty close to the hip. So that way, if we ever need it, we can go back to it. Because we know if we throw it all away, if we, if we cut that sin off, if we trash that and we dunk it and it's gone forever, then, then it's hard to get back. It's hard when you kill sin and you put it to death and you cleave it off of yourself and you remove it like he's saying, like cut your own eye out. If you do that, it's hard to get back to that sin. But if you just do what's necessary to toe the line, then it's really easy. Because right? we have this mindset in the church that that in order to do well, you must just follow the rules inside of these boundaries. And we'll toe the edges of the boundaries because it's about checking off a box. It's not about obedience. Because obedience is not saying, where's the line? Let me get close to it. Just hug right here. No, no, no. Obedience is saying, where's the line? Let me get above approach and move over here. That's what obedience is. Obedience is saying, I will not get myself close to that. I'm going to do what I'm asked to do when I'm asked to do it. Towing the line it's not obedience. That's legalism. It's legalism. That's just action for the sake of action. That's nothing to do with the real depth of it all. You need to fight your sin. If you want to defend plausible arguments, fight your sin. Because here's the thing. 
If we're knit together in love, and we're meant to be the body of Christ that extends out, here's what happens. If we're not knit together in, into love, you know what happens? Two things. We either, A, we, we don't do anything. And so it's like the idea that a, a piece of the body has been removed. It's like chopping your toe off and trying to run a marathon. Can't do it. Or we do the worst possible thing. We really desire to be a functioning member of the church body, but we don't fight for righteousness, and then we sin and everyone sees it, and it paints a picture of Christ that's not true. It paints a picture of the church that's not true. Those are both big areas we can fall flat on our face. Either we are inactive and we do nothing, or we are active, but we don't do the, we don't do the necessary steps behind it to put, present ourselves approved. This is why people fall. This is why people stumble. God didn't give you a spirit of timidity. He gave you a spirit of courage. He gave you his word. He gave you his spirit. He has set you up for success. <coughs> That's the last thing he says here. He says, see that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition. But how do you not get taken captive? You fight, right? Like, what is the thing? I've, I've never taken a self-defense class, but some of you ladies, <coughs> what's the thing they tell you to do first and foremost if someone tries to attack you? Scream bloody murder, right? Like, claw, fight, you know, slap and punch in areas that no one should ever be hit in. Right, like I, I do remember that there was in college there was a self defense class that met at the same time as my uh, weight training or I don't remember what class it was. It was a gym class that I had to have for college, uh, and I'll never forget the day that they taught them uh, if someone was trying to mug you in an ATM, and the first thing they did was scream, and the second thing was if the guy poached his arm around you, you <laughs> like this. And I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, that's just that's perfect. Do it. Go for it. You know. Like, more power to you. That's what you have to do when you fight against sin. Claw and fight and grab and punch and kick and swing violently. Like throw haymakers. Act like a crazy person if you have to in order to not be taken captive by your sin and by the elemental spirits of the world and by empty deceit. Fight and kick and claw until you can get there. Fight for righteousness. If you have no desire to fight and you just want to roll over and play dead, what is going on in your mind? What's going on in your spirit? I can tell you one of two things. Either one, you are so far from God because you have ran the opposite direction from Him. Or two, you never were in a relationship with Him to begin with. And you need Jesus either way. Fight and kick and claw. So that, and this is what he says at the end in verse 9 and 10. He says, For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in Him who is the head of all rule and authority. <coughs> Now you you fight against these things and you scratch and claw. And you fight for your holiness with this in mind. The fact that Jesus already did it. It's already taken care of. Right? It circles all the way back around when we talked about in the beginning. Be hot or cold. Why? Because Jesus is taking care of it. Right? He said he, he desires to see these things happen for the church in Laodicea and Colossae. He wants to be knit together in love. Why? Because they have the Spirit of God living inside of them. It's living in you. It has already won. This life, your flesh, your sin, death and hell have no power over you. Revelation tells us that. that he has the keys to death and Hades. He's got them. He holds the keys to them. Death has no power over the believer. Your life has no power over you as a believer. God has given you one purpose as a believer, and that is to share the message of hope for all people to hear. That is to share the gospel of Christ to all people in all areas, in all nations. That's what he says in the beginning of this, right? He tells, he tells us that's what you've been called to do. We talked about that last week. You suffer and you do all these things so that the message of God may be heard to all people. The word of God may be spread to all people because there is no option. Right? You read, read the scriptures. Read Acts chapter 1. Let me flip over there. I shouldn't have taken my bookmark out in the first service. Acts chapter 1. Acts 
chapter 1, <coughs> says this in verse uh, 8. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's not an option. It's not an if. It's you will. You will go. You will do. And that's the reason I love that quote from John Piper where he says, go, sin, or disobey. Those are your options. The message of the gospel must go to all people, both here in Murphy and in Cherokee County and in Hayesville and in the tri-state area and Mexico, Honduras, Africa, Guatemala, everywhere we've got missionaries. The message of the gospel is for all people and it is not an option where you take part in it. You must take part in all areas of that. When you go, you will be my disciples. And when you go, you will go to all of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. We have a mission and a goal as a church. And that involves being a light and hope of the gospel and boldly proclaiming Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection both here in this community and to the ends of the earth. And we do all of that because he's given us his spirit, just like we're reading here in Colossians. He's given us his spirit. He has told us to fight sin. And he has made it known that we are to do all things for one purpose and one purpose alone, to make the word of God fully known. Make it fully known. And the, all last week as I studied and prepared for this, I had no, like, I, this was not where I was going to finish this. I sat there yesterday, and I was, you know, I was talking to people, hanging out with some folks and friends of mine that I've known for a long time, and seeing stuff that people were posting. And I was reminded, the whole point of all of this is to share the, the message of the gospel to all people. That's always been the motive of the church. That was the motive of the church in, in Acts chapter 1. That's, that's Peter, the shepherd, the sheep. The church exploded across all nations. We talked about this last week too. Right? The message is for both Jew and Greek. Right? Gentiles. Which majority of us probably have Gentile background. Which means at some point, somebody came to your people to preach the gospel to your people. Me, like, I, I'm, most of my heritage is Irish and Cherokee Indian. The Moravians sent missionaries to the United States, to the Cherokee Indian people. Because of those missionaries, people in my family lineage became believers in Christ, the message of the gospel, to spread to the people in the Cherokee Nation. I mean, I can't tell you the countless stories of the missionaries who went to Ireland. Tons of them. And then came out of Ireland. Because someone preached the gospel to my people a thousand years ago, I have the opportunity to receive and hear the gospel. But there are people all over the world who do not have that option. If they wake up today, there's no church, there's no missionary, there's no scripture in their language, there is nothing. But here's what's crazy. In Murphy, North Carolina, there are churches and there are people and there are still people in this community that if they wake up today, no one will share the gospel with them. No one will share the message of hope with them. No one will communicate the gospel to them. And they won't step the foot in, in, into a church door today. Because they felt judged and exiled and treated poorly by people who claimed to be Christians before. And they don't know the true message of the gospel. They know a very skewed message of the gospel that they've seen lived out by some people. There are people everywhere who need Jesus. And you have been given all power and authority from him and a spirit that lives inside of you and the ability to fight your sin and proclaim that message of hope. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to proclaim it? How are you going to teach it? How are you going to say it? How does your life reflect it? Challenge yourself with that this morning. I'm going to pray and we're going to sing together.